Kevin, uh, circling back for a minute here to this uh, oil slick resulting from uh, a leak at Unit 5, that would be radioactive oil on the that's mostly floating on the surface of the sea uh, just offshore from Fukushima. Uh, what, what are the risks of trying to clean up uh, oil? Uh, that's difficult enough, but if it's uh, radioactively charged, then that's an even greater risk uh, to the humans who would be involved in such an operation. Well, you're right. Um, there's still a lot to be figured out about how bad the radioactivity is building up. Uh, Greenpeace has reported discovering uh, radioactive edible seaweed even 30 kilometers or about 20 miles off the Fukushima coast. So the food chain in, and the ecosystem, the ecology, is reconcentrating the radioactivity that's being released in large amounts from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The Japanese federal government, from the first days of this catastrophe, was trying to downplay the oceanic releases, saying that it's a big ocean, it will dilute, don't worry about it, it'll go away as if it was disappearing into nothingness. Well, there's a phenomenon called bioaccumulation, which reconcentrates the radioactivity up the food chain. And now, as you said, with this oil, uh, if there are people sent in to deal with the oil spill, which I imagine must be a low priority given what else is going on on the site, they're going to be exposed to uh, the radioactivity that is in the ocean and levels that even Tokyo Electric and the Japanese government have admitted to have included millions of time permissible doses of things like radioactive iodine-131 in the seawater, which then uh, seaweed and kelp will concentrate yet more. And that probably explains why Greenpeace found such high levels even uh, 20 miles offshore. And, Kevin, what is the overall risk uh, of uh, radioactivity in the seawater uh, because we know that uh, tens of thousands, I, I have no idea how many gallons of seawater were pumped out and onto the uh, overheated reactors during the attempts to cool them. Uh, do we have any way of calculating uh, what that level of risk is and, and how far uh, from Fukushima that radioactive uh, uh, elements in the water might spread? Well, a figure I just saw in the last couple of days is that 100,000 tons of water have been poured onto these uh, four units in crisis, 100,000 tons of cooling water. And uh, another figure from many weeks ago is that 11,500 tons of that cooling water were then discharged intentionally into the ocean to free up storage space for even more highly contaminated radioactive water. They are very ad hoc at this point. They're using buildings on the site to store these large volumes of water that are radioactively contaminated that were never intended for that purpose. They're using radioactive waste storage buildings. They're using a radioactive waste incineration building, which is kind of scary on its face. And they're using other facilities just to pump water into because as they pour water continuously onto these uh, melting down reactors to try to cool them, that water is leaking out, and they have to put it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of it they've intentionally released into the ocean. Some of it has accidentally leaked into the ocean through cracks, probably caused by the earthquake, and then they've tried to patch those cracks. They've even uh, proposed bringing in floating barges, which would be hollow in the center, and then pouring you know, vast amounts of radioactive water into these barges, which you know, theoretically would be contained, but it would be floating on the ocean. And a big question remains, where will the water go to? And now they're bringing in from Arriva of France, a large French government-owned nuclear company. They're bringing in from Russia these radioactive water processing units. And uh, it'll be a race, though, to try to keep up with the huge amounts that they're generating. Now and let's... You had asked, what, what is sure. the risk further out in the ocean? Yeah, how far does this radiate? Well, the currents uh, from Japan, the, the large-scale currents actually flow to the U.S. West Coast, to the North American West Coast. So the currents will carry the radioactivity dissolved in the seawater this away. The Japanese federal government and Tokyo Electric would like people to think that it just disappears into nothingness. Well, it does dilute, but I mentioned that reconcentration mechanism called bioaccumulation of the food chain. 
And then there are species of fish like albacore tuna and certain species of salmon, which actually physically migrate from Japan to the west coast of North America. So they, too, being high up on the food chain themselves, are going to be bringing radioactive contamination in their very flesh uh, to North America. So let's turn now to the airborne release of uh, radiation. And you referred to some of the explosions uh, we certainly saw in the early days of the crisis uh, on television, uh, several of the explosions, and you could see the destruction of the uh, external containment uh, uh, structures uh, on the reactors. And uh, so, so give us a sense uh, of what we know and what is still unknown about the extent of airborne releases and the level of radioactivity emanating from them? Well, uh, from the very earliest hours even of this catastrophe and certainly the first days, they were intentionally venting the primary containment structures of radioactive steam into the environment to try to prevent a catastrophic breach of those primary containment structures due to overpressurization. It was an indication of how small and how weak these primary containment structures are That weakness has been known for many decades, back to like 1972 here in the U.S., and we have 23 identical reactor designs here in the U.S. They're called General Electric Boiling Water Reactors of the Mark I design. We've known, you know, since 1972 that these containments would not live up to an accident and the pressures and the temperatures. So they intentionally released radioactivity. That didn't even work. It actually contributed to the explosions that took place with the hydrogen gas. And uh, since then, there have been um, fires in Unit 4. Again, the pools, the storage pools for high-level radioactive waste are located high up in these buildings above or next to the reactors. They are now um, facing the open sky. There is no containment whatsoever over the pools. There was never a primary containment that's reinforced concrete and steel. Just this industrial building, well, that's gone. And so if there are releases from the pools, then that's directly into the atmosphere. Those hydrogen explosions uh, led to acute spikes of radioactivity when they took place. So that has uh, flowed with the air currents um, all over the northern hemisphere. There have been elevated readings of radioactivity documented in North America, Canada, and the U.S., as well as in Europe. There have been warnings from... uh, for example, a group called CREAD in France, which is a environmental group, but they're a radiological testing laboratory. That's their specialty. They came into being to counter the French government's dismissal back in 1986 that Chernobyl fallout was reaching France. So they busted the French government back then, lying. Well, they're, they're still active, and they have shown fallout in France from Fukushima, and they have warned people in France against what they call risky behavior, which they mean uh, consuming dairy products, actually. They're warning people about the consumption of dairy products because it will contain radioactive iodine and other fallout from Fukushima. And, Kevin, uh, we've seen that despite uh, cultural barriers, uh, Japanese citizens have been uh, much and much more assertive and aggressive in confronting TEPCO, the utility, and uh, the national government. Uh, regarding evacuations, regarding uh, whether it's safe for young people, for example, to be within a certain radius of the plant. And I'm wondering what your sense is of the level of confidence we should have in the United States government in our ability to monitor uh, radioactivity uh, airborne or uh, in the sea or in the food chain And can we rely on our government to tell us the truth uh, in the event we reach levels that uh, we should be concerned about? Well, I'm not an expert on Japanese culture. I've been lucky enough to to visit there a couple times for this anti-nuclear work um, in the past 10 years. And just from my own observations, the Japanese people are are very meek people, uh, very courteous, uh, polite in most circumstances, almost across the board. So this, this uh, very passionate activism that's underway in Japan by the parents of Fukushima to protect their young children against radioactivity in their schoolyards is really remarkable that people are willing to confront very directly 
Tokyo Electric and various levels of government right up to the top levels of the Japanese education ministry. And they've just reversed the Japanese government's attempt to allow, to permit children to be exposed to 20 times the level of radioactivity at school than was previously allowed before Fukushima started. They've gotten that reversed, luckily. It's going to require government in Japan to remove the topsoil at schools if they want to keep these schools open to get rid of the radioactive contamination that's already fallen out there. They were, you know, at two rem per year for school children. That would have been equivalent to what nuclear power plant workers in Germany are allowed to get in a year. So that's been reversed. It's really good news. It's taken a month and a half to accomplish that. Lots of protests in Tokyo by Fukushima parents.